since I come from Norway, it's always nice to be in Sweden uh, to get uh, across to our neighbors. Um, and yesterday, uh, I came directly to Stockholm from Spain. Um, and here, there I met with maize farmers. Um, Spain is the only country in Europe that grows GMOs to uh, some extent. And this is maize for animal feed. Uh, in Spain, there are no rules for coexistence or distance uh, between GM farmers and non-GM farmers. And that causes a lot of trouble for the conventional farmers, because their crop get, gets contaminated with GMOs. And that means they cannot sell it for human consumption and get the premium price that they otherwise would. Uh, and organic farmers cannot sell their crop as organic. So Spain must import most of its organic maize from Italy. Um, this situation, uh, yeah, the, the non-GM farmers also pay a lot for testing their crops for uh, GMOs. And this situation uh, causes a lot of trouble uh, among neighbors and distrust, uh, which is not what we would like for GMOs. Um, so how can we, avoid, can we avoid this now that we have new gene technologies uh, like CRISPR uh, and possibilities for new products? Uh, is it possible to uh, develop and use GMOs in a way that is of benefit to society and that doesn't harm anybody. Uh, what I'd like you to remember when I finish is that uh, there are more concerns that people have about GMOs than risks to health and the environment. Uh, and that we should include those concerns when we evaluate GMOs. Uh, in Norway, uh, our Gene Technology Act uh, has five assessment criteria. Uh, there should be um, no unacceptable, unacceptable risk to health and the environment. But the GMO should also contribute to sustainable development. Uh, it should be of benefit to society. And it should be ethically justifiable. So Norway was the first country uh, to take such concerns into uh, the GMO legislation in 1993. Uh, and later on, uh, the EU has followed to some extent, uh, because uh, countries can now take socioeconomic considerations into account uh, when they decide if they want to cultivate a GMO or not. And also, under the uh, UN uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, we have the Cartagena Protocol, uh, at, which is a trade agreement uh, uh, um, about the biosafety of GMOs. And countries can, can here also choose if they want to take socioeconomic considerations into account. Um, and for a Nordic Swan eco-label, um, um, we don't uh, um, say yes or no to GMOs. That's what the authorities do at the Nordic Swan eco-label. Um, we have requirements uh, for GMOs in products, in certain products, um, that we can put an eco-label on. Uh, so uh, we also use uh, these principles when we set the requirements for GMOs in eco-labeled products. Uh, and then we'll uh, uh, talk a bit more about these uh, three criteria. First, benefit to society. What is it? To be of a benefit to society, um, the, the GMO should solve a problem for someone. For instance, disease problems in crops. And um, it should solve a problem not just for one person or for one farmer, but uh, it must be, be large groups of people if it's going to be of bene benefit to society. Um, and uh, authorities may request uh, benefit cost analysis, uh, like they do for other issues that may affect environment and society. And there are methodologies for that. Um, then uh, you have to assess both monetary and non-monetary values. Uh, and uh, then you have to compare with something. And it's uh, natural to compare with the closest non-GM relative, uh, or the closest uh, or the non-GM production system. Uh, maybe the system that is in that area. But then you also could ask, uh, what, are, there, are there any alternatives for solving this problem? Are there any alternatives that are even better than the GMO? Now we'll look at two examples. Um, this is a, a potato farmer that I know, Lars Winden. He has, uh, like other potato farmers, had problems with the late blight disease that we heard about earlier. And also in Norway, farmers spray a lot, up to 10 times a season um, against this disease, and it, or um, late blight, and it costs a lot of money. So um, he says that he would welcome a more resistant variety, even if it's a GMO, as long as it works. Uh, and to um, consider this, uh, we must consider uh, the cost of a seed potato, 
uh, pesticides and machinery, uh, what would be the price of the products he sells, uh, and what could be ecosystem effects because there are less pesticides. Uh, and also some people are concerned about uh, the trust people have in our national food production, which in Norway currently is uh, free of GMOs. And there is also an issue of uh, how long does the resistance last? And you may also ask, uh, uh, are there any alternatives? Are there other late light tolerant potatoes? Could we prioritize this more in breeding? Uh, could we have better cultivation practices? And let's move to the animal sector. Um, this is a Swedish researcher in fish farming. She works in Norway at the Marine Research Institute in Bergen. Her name is Anna Vargelius. And in fish farming, it's a big problem that farmed fish escapes and breeds with wild salmon. Um, so what if you could make the farmed salmon sterile? And that's ex exactly what she's working on. Uh, she has used CRISPR um, to, made, to make a sterile fish. Uh, but what she actually wants to do is to develop a vaccine. But you may imagine that you can use um, this fish directly as farmed fish. Then it would be a GMO. Uh, this would, of course, benefit the wild salmon, and it, you could say it could benefit the environment. And also fish farming is very important for the Norwegian economy. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to ask, um, what if it doesn't work so well? It might chase the wild salmon from its breeding grounds anyway. And also ask about the alternatives. Then you maybe get this vaccine. Could be an alternative. And some people would even uh, start talking about uh, that we should have closed facilities to prevent the fish, fish from escaping. And that brings us to the issue of sustainable development. Um, when we assess sustainable development, we have to assess all the three dimensions. Not only environment, but also economy and society. And also, uh, no technology exists all by itself. So we need to assess the system, the technology package. Um, in agriculture, it means that we assess not only the crop itself, uh, but the agricultural system that it is made for and used in. So that may include changes in pesticide use. Sustainability uh, also mean, means to look at global consequences. Uh, for Norway, it means if we consider if a GMO should be allowed for import, um, we look at effects in the country where the GMO is grown. And today, today's GMOs often have short-term advantages. <coughs> but after some years, it may look different. So we should also consider the long-term effects. And a good example here is the herbicide-resistant soybean. This is the most commonly grown uh, GM crop in the world, and it's modified to tolerate a specific herbicide, such as glyphosate. Farmers uh, can spray with glyphosate in the growing season, uh, so the weeds die, but the GM soya is still alive. Uh, and this means the farmers can manage the weeds more easily. Uh, that's the whole point. Uh, the problem is that uh, when you use the same herbicide over and over again in the same fields, uh, weeds will develop resistance. And this, of course, also happens with non-GMOs. Um, but uh, this GMO, if you look at the whole package, it's designed to use with glyphosate, or otherwise you wouldn't buy the GMO. So it encourages the use of glyphosate. Uh, and when resistance develops, uh, farmers have to use more herbicides or different herbicides. And also, if you introduce this uh, GMO into a system of industrial agriculture, you may substitute um, for a more toxic herbicide, which would be a good thing. Um, but what has happening in some countries, like in the United States and South America, is that uh, some of these toxic herbicides that were phased out in the 1990s, they are increasingly being used again, such as 2,4-D. And the GMO companies have also made crops that are resistant to several herbicides. Uh, on the contrary, in the EU, uh, it's uh, compulsory by law with something called integrated pest management. This means you have to use a variety of means to combat the weeds and pests, such as better crop rotation, cover crops, mechanical means. You can only use herbicides or pesticides when there's no other way. And you can only use the amount needed when it is needed. Today, there are only two big traits in genetically modified plants, and the other one is insect resistance. Uh, this maize in Spain is insect resistant, and it's modified, so it produces toxins that kill certain insect pests. 
And um, the toxin is always produced in a plant, also when no pest attacks. And this in many places has worked well the first years, uh, but in the long term, uh, resistance uh, has become an issue. But this varies a lot with regions and with countries. In South Africa, uh, it was almost useless from the start. In Spain, it's been not too bad, it's been okay so far. Uh, and in the US, uh, problems are now starting to show in the Midwest. Uh, another important issue with these insect resistance crops is how uh, they affect non-target organisms. Uh, those are organisms that are not meant to be killed. Could be butterflies, other insects, ladybirds, bees. Uh, and here, um, uh, scientific studies show conflicting results, and there's a lack of long-term studies. There's also a lack of knowledge on aquatic organisms and microorganisms in the soil. And another impact is secondary pests. Um, when you eradicate one pest, um, other pests may occupy their ecological niche. <coughs> um, and because um, of resistance problems, the most common GMOs today are so-called stacks. Uh, this uh, maize is called, uh, maize called smart stacks, and it produces six different toxins against insects. And it's also resistant to two herbicides. And here we'll, we will have cumulative effects. Uh, and those effects are not much studied. Um, it's not required um, for risk assessment today. And another issue uh, of uh, combined effects is what happens if you cultivate many GMOs in an area. Uh, it may be okay with one or two types of, uh, of GMOs, but you may reach a threshold uh, where it's no longer okay for the environment. And uh, one thing to consider here is gene flow. I took this picture in Canada last summer. That's what I take pictures of on holidays. So uh, this is a GM canola or rapeseed. Uh, in Norway, uh, several rapeseed GMOs have been prohibited because of environmental risk. They very easily cross, but cross with wild relatives or other cultivated rapeseed. And that's called gene flow. Uh, and what really could make it spread is if the GM plant has increased fitness so that it survives better than the wild relative. And so it really matters uh, if you have uh, deliberate release of a GMO into the environment or if it's contained use. To the left here, you can see a microalgae facility of a Norwegian company called MicroA. Um, and to the right, maize in the field. Uh, to the left, uh, with a uh, closed facility, uh, you can keep control and it doesn't spread. And then you have animals. Um, pigs, you are able to control to a certain extent. Insects, you cannot control much, and bacteria are very hard to control. And in addition to ecological impacts from GMOs, there are social and economic issues. And first, uh, who controls our food system? Uh, is it Monsanto? Maybe not in the Nordic countries, at least. GMOs have played a role in the concentration of power in the seed uh, industry, uh, in that very few companies control commercial sales of seeds internationally. About three companies now controls half of the market. But of course, GMOs are not the only reason. But it's easier to get uh, patents for GMOs uh, because uh, it's easier to show yet that you did something new. So in that way, uh, GMO development is encouraged. And you also need money to uphold the patents, uh, which is something that big companies have. Uh, and why is patents an issue? Uh, it's partly because it's got to do with if plants are available for further breeding. To breed for the future, uh, farmers and breeders need access to as many uh, varieties as possible, as much genetic variation as possible, so that they can breed the plants we need. It could be tolerance to humidity, heat, frost, drought, diseases. Uh, and in several countries, patents have been used to deny others uh, to use plants for further breeding. Uh, and there are alternatives. Uh, there are uh, plant breeders' rights, um, which can give you protection for your innovation. But at the same time, others may use it for further breeding. Uh, but here, uh, you cannot leave everything to, to companies or breeders, and authorities must also take responsibility to make regulations that secure further breeding. And who controls the food production also has to do with ethics. Ethics is about what is right to do, especially when we must prioritize between different values, people or groups. It's got to do with humans as well as animals and the environment. Uh, for instance, um, do, do we violate the intrinsic value of nature? How far should we go to intervene with nature? 
And for humans, one question could be if there are groups in society that need special protection. One ethical issue is consumers' right to choose and the labeling of GMOs. And we talked about the democratic rights of farmers that don't want to grow GMOs and their right to choose, but also consumers want to choose. In the EU and Norway and many other countries in the world, labeling of GM food and feed is compulsory by law. Um, and surveys show that a majority of consumers think that this is important. Many people are also concerned about independent risk research. Um, today, a majority of the documentation for risk assessment in the EU comes from applicants. And it has been difficult for independent researchers to gain access to data to analyze. But recently, the EU has said they will give better access and more transparency. Uh, and this will again increase the trust among the public. Uh, it's also been difficult uh, for researchers to get ac access to plant material um, to do research. Uh, and the research itself, um, there is actually quite a lot of research done by, um, by companies or researchers related to companies. Uh, but uh, uh, when it comes to potentially adverse effects, um, those are shown in uh, papers from independent research. And it, it's not because uh, scientists are mean or that they want to cheat, but, uh, um, but your background may influence the questions you ask and the methods you use. And there's a lot of disagreement among scientists and policymakers what issues should be addressed. Um, for instance, uh, what non-target organisms should be tested, for how long, and with what methods. There's a lot of discussion about that. Um, so one thing we can do is to involve stakeholders. Uh, this is the Norwegian Biotechnology Advisory Board, where I have worked for many years. Uh, and you can have such ethical committees uh, where different groups of stakeholders participate. Stakeholders may also be engaged in open hearings of GMO applications, like it's currently done in the EU. And in research projects, we have the concept of responsible research and innovation, RRI. This is now a required part of many research projects also within biotechnology. <clears throat> and stakeholders are here involved at an early stage to discuss possible outcomes, and what they think of them. And uh, uh, they also contribute with valuable knowledge based on their experiences. This may influence the course of the projects and what products are eventually made. Uh, so now, um, when we have involved stakeholders and we have made some assessments, how do we decide what to do? Uh, science can describe how things are, but it cannot tell us what we should do. That depends on values and political priorities. And we have to decide what values we think are the most important. One thing to do is to weigh the benefits against the risks. If there are no benefits, people are usually not willing to take risks, not even small risks. Uh, and what should you do if there are uncertainties? You don't know much about neither what could be possible harmful impacts or benefits. And you don't know um, um, the probability uh, of the outcomes. And especially uh, if it's uh, irreversible, uh, a threat of irreversible harm to human health or the environment, uh, then we might apply the precautionary principle. That means we uh, could not allow a GMO or we could allow it with restrictions until we gain more knowledge. And this means that developers uh, have the burden of proof, which is a value-based decision. Uh, this is done when uh, authorities, authorities assess GMO applications. Uh, and this is also what we do at the Nordic Swan Ecolabel, when we decide our criteria for ecolabeling of various products. We start out with what regulations demand, um, but we want to encourage companies to develop more sustainable products, so we have stricter standards. And when there is uncertainty, we always give the, in the environment the benefit of the doubt. So consumers should be sure when they buy an eco-labeled product that this is the most environmentally friendly product within its category. And we may also ask what are the best alternatives uh, to solve a problem. And that might be related to what kind of agriculture we want. And uh, some people claim that this limits innovation, um, but uh, when we do this, and we also include concerns beyond risk, such as sustainability, ethics, and benefit to society, 
we encourage certain types of innovation that society needs and wants and accepts. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for out? Yes, I knew there would be. Uh, Marie Newman, the Swedish Student Technology Advisory Board. Uh, I didn't really get why uh, conventional farmers bother for the gene flow from GMO. Uh, I mean, conventional. I can understand organic farmers, but but not conventional farmers. If it was not the, like it was from uh, maize from feed or to a maize sugar mm -hmm. maize, but that's another thing. Yeah, it's because they um, uh, they want to sell maize for human uh, consumption, and for human consumption, um, um, customers do not want GMOs, so they want to sell it as GMO free, and they get a premium price for that. So they sell it GMO free. Yes. But then it's more like organic, then? Um, no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. not organic agriculture. Oh. It's just GMO-free. Oh. So that's the problem, I would say. That, uh, that I think the organic uh, uh, industry should embrace GMO, actually. And another thing, you talked about uh, non-target species. And you said ladybirds and bees. I mean, I would say it's, uh, it's consensus that they don't harm it. And if they should harm it, then if organic uh, farmers spray, it would be the same. But I, I think I have 25, 30 articles on BT and bees. Uh, yes, so uh, with bees, uh, you're right. That's, uh, that's just an example uh, of uh, organisms that you should uh, look for. So uh, there, it hasn't been shown that uh, BT crops actually harm bees. But you um, said it was conflicting results, but I yeah. say it's not conflicting results. But in, on other organisms, like aquatic not organisms, there are conflicting results. For, for example, which? Uh, like the Daphnia and also, oh, that's and also those organisms that uh, we don't know anything about yet. Yeah. So there's disagreement on what you should look for, what organisms, what methods you should use, duration. Etc. So Daphne is so the there is no consensus. I yeah, I would say it is. There was another question uh, behind. Anna Lerman, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Um, it's more of a comment. I think it's very unfortunate when we talk about GMOs as one thing. Uh, if you consider the potato resistant against late blight that actually got it's seen from a wild potato. And then you have the herbicide tolerant soy. And you have the virus resistant papaya. If you look at what they have in common, is it the agricultural practices? No. The patents? No. Health? No. Environmental impact? They really don't have any more in common than that they are considered as GMOs. So I think at this stage, I, I think we left for 10 years ago talking about GMOs as one thing. We have to talk about the traits, not the technology. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting point. It does not conflict with what you said, though. Um, no, not really. I mean, uh, uh, that's why you also have um, case by case assessment systems, because GMOs are not just one thing. It's a very good point. Yeah. And we also we assess that technology means that we um, have the regulation, but it's the product that we actually evaluate. Uh, I, I have a question then before we begin the panel discussion. And that was a little bit about the technology that is used whenever these types of cost benefit analyses or, or risk assessments that, are, that you do in the, in the advisory board, for example, these systems are very large to consider. As you mentioned, it's hard to know what the impact of some of these things will be. So my question then is, what type of technology is used? I mean, is, is there computer modeling going on? Or can we bring the AI into play here? I mean, how do you see that aspect uh, of yes, it? Yes, and uh, now uh, with the new technologies, with the uh, genomics and proteomics and metabolomics, um, you can start using that to, to, to analyze the GMOs and to see what's produced. and and um, that should certainly um, make uh, uh, contributions to the risk assessment. So maybe you don't have to use, do so many field studies or you don't have yeah. to do animal feeding studies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, really something uh, one should look into. Yeah. 
I'm, th I'm thinking about the societal benefit. I mean, it's so hard to predict who's going to be affected and who is not. I mean, even beyond DNA sequencing, it feels like that this type of work would be very valuable. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, if you involve stakeholders, you will, um, you will get to know what different groups are concerned about. And then uh, you, when you make a decision, you have to decide uh, what is the most important, what is the values that are most important. Um, but it's also important for people to feel that they are being heard, even if the decision doesn't uh, uh, go in their favor. Mm -hmm.